Morning, Daniel. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, looks like I don't have my video up. No, you're fine. I just went ahead and got the room started early. Yeah. So how do you think uh, turnout will be today? We have about... Um, it looked last time I checked the uh, registration or whatnot yesterday, we had about 35 registrants, um, not including like me, you, and other people that are going to be presenting and stuff like that. So, okay, um, that's good. Yeah, should should be good. And then we're going to also simultaneously. I got to set this. I'm going to set that up. So I'm going to shut up and go on mute for just a second. Um, uh, simultaneously streaming on Facebook Live. So I assume we're going to get a lot more um, people watching and commenting and stuff like that than we currently have, quote unquote, registered. Cool. Sorry, give me just a second. Your video turned out really good, by the way. Did it? Oh, yeah. great. I'm, I'm eager to see it. <laughs> of course, nobody likes their own videos. So you'll be like, oh, I did terrible. Yeah, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I never like to watch myself speak. That is that is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it turned hey, out how, was, how was the EV event last weekend? The one last weekend and the Huntsville one was mm -hmm. crazy. Uh, we had probably close to a hundred vehicles there. Uh, wow. Yeah. It, it was pretty nuts. You know, we, we basically took up the front. We had reserved, if you will, uh, the front of stove house, that main parking lot right on governors. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we ended up taking one row all the way, like basically three rows full of parking all the way down. Most of it was, you know, a little bit of space in between cars, but it, it was a lot. We had a lot. Was it a good variety? Yes, we had a ton of different vehicles. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, mean, I was listening mostly, mostly Teslas, of course, probably about 50% Teslas, but that's probably the oh. lowest percentage of Teslas we've ever had. Yeah. Well, I was listening to an, an NPR article uh, or a new segment, uh, I think it was uh, yesterday evening, and it was talking about, um, it was with uh, Kai Rizdahl, on uh, marketplace and EVs are now taking up about 2% of the car market, which seems relatively low, but it is, it is, uh, as they were talking, describing it, it is actually, I mean, it's growing substantially and, and at a ra rapid pace and it's going to continue to, you know, build into a greater percentage so, um, and then, you know, that, and hopefully we get an infrastructure bill passed and there's EV, more EV infrastructure being worked on, um, future's bright. Yep, for sure. And they were just talking about too, how, you know, with new, uh, auto, with more automakers entering the market with EVs, the prices of course are coming down, you know, whereas a couple of years ago, you know, you weren't probably touching one, you know, for under $50,000, you know, that wasn't a tin can or something like that to now where, hey, it's stuff's becoming pretty competitive. So, you know, Tesla still controls, you know, market share, but, you know, it's, it's got competition, which is good. Yep. About time. Yep. And I say that being a Tesla owner now. Well, no, I mean, they get all credit in the world for changing the market. So, oh, absolutely. All right. Hey, Stephen.
Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we got all kinds of great friendly faces. All right, I'm going to give folks a few more minutes and we're going to stream this uh, on Facebook as well. We got some great videos for y'all and hope you came prepared with lots of questions. Make folks like John and Steven that are on the call this morning sweat. I need to, I need to make them feel the pressure. I'm just kidding. All right, I'm going to keep everybody muted, um, but you can still come off mute. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. I think everybody already is muted. But uh, just as we start to show videos and things like that, I'll uh, make sure that we got uh, silence so people can hear. And then y'all are feel, feel free to come off mute a little bit later. So give us just a second. Good morning, Lucy. All right. Well, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to uh, a virtual Alabama solar tour. Unfortunately, I wish we could do a, a lot more uh, in person. Maybe this time next year, we'll finally, finally be able to do that. I really thought we were going to be, be able to make some progress this year and see some folks in person, but understandably so. We uh, want to be extra safe and um, make sure everybody's well taken care of. So uh, for folks who don't know me or the Alabama Solar Tour and what we are doing here today, I'm Daniel Tate. I'm with Energy Alabama, and we have lots of friendly faces, a few new folks that I'm not familiar with. So give me just a, a second. I wanted to tell you a little bit about Energy Alabama and kind of what to expect for the day. Uh, I am the chief operating officer here, and I'm joined uh, by some friends. And one of those is, is Mr. Jonathan Rosso. John Rosso, he's on our board of directors here at Energy Alabama and is one of the videos that we're going to be showing today because he's got a, a pretty cool abode on Montesano Mountain here in Huntsville that we want to show off. Um, but our work here at Energy Alabama is around accelerating the transition to sustainable energy. And a lot of the work that we do is uh, everything from education to advocacy. So, you know, everything from working K through 12 schools and doing public events, a lot like we're doing here to help teach people what is the realm of the possible, if you will, when it comes to things like energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, and electric transportation. This is a busy time for us. Uh, if you are in the Birmingham area, there's also an electric vehicle event uh, at Pe Pepper Place today. Um, it is, uh, we'll be starting here shortly. So you're going to get your fill, uh, not of gasoline, of course, but fill of all things <laughs> sustainable energy uh, and be able to take a look here uh, at sustainable buildings and also some sustainable vehicles. Uh, we did a couple of EV events uh, earlier this week, one in Huntsville. We had almost uh, probably between 75 and 100 vehicles. It was just a massive turnout we had there. So that was extremely good at Stove House. And then one uh, just a few days ago in Auburn. And uh, we had probably a dozen or two, a dozen or so vehicles there at, at, the, at the Auburn uh, University, uh, University of Auburn campus. And uh, that was great. Uh, 
So uh, really appreciate y'all joining us. Uh, again, uh, I'm Daniel Tate with Energy Alabama. And we have uh, a first couple of videos that we wanted to show today uh, that would have been your in-person stops if you would have been able to do this. This is uh, Mr. John Rosso and Mr. Steve, Stephen McClam uh, here in the Huntsville area. We're gonna, after showing those two videos, uh, we will kind of pause for some Q&A, so make sure as you're watching these videos to be ready with some questions. Uh, I may pepper some in as well. Um, feel free to use the chat uh, on Zoom, uh, and if you're joining us live on Facebook, you can just comment down below the video if you have questions that you want to ask, and we'll try to make sure that we, we get to those questions. If you're joining us on Zoom, you're able to come off mute and just ask your question if you feel comfortable, but you don't have to. You can type it in the chat, and we'll try to get to ask it for you. Uh, after the Q&A of our couple of guys here from the Huntsville area, we're going to show uh, about three videos from the Birmingham area uh, that we have worked with our partner, uh, Eagle Solar and Light, to be able to bring those to you uh, today. And we have a couple of commercial locations and then also a really killer location in UAB Solar House. Uh, so we're going to show a video of that as well, which, by the way, is open for tours in person. Of course, you need to schedule that so that they can keep safe distancing and things like that. But if you're in the Birmingham area and interested in seeing the UAB Solar House in person, that is an option. So we definitely uh, will share information about how to do that and would recommend uh, that to everybody here. So let's go ahead and get started unless anybody has any last minute questions that I'll pause for just a second or uh, take a look here at the chat and see if anyone has any questions before we get started. All right, y'all are a really easy crowd for me. No questions. All right, perfect. Well, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And let's get started on video number one. We bought the property in 2017. Uh, I'm retired military. Uh, my wife and I were looking for uh, a place to, to build our, our dream home. And uh, part of that dream home was to, to have a sustainable house um, that was energy efficient, um, that uh, could uh, provide its own power or sell power back to the grid. Uh, so part of you know being a resilient distributed grid. Um, and so the concept for the house was uh, to use materials um, that uh, were energy efficient, uh, to use appliances that were energy efficient. Uh, they use solar panels uh, to uh, generate uh, electricity, and uh, you know, in the end, what we wanted was uh, something that was sustainable. Um, you know, into uh, how many ever years we live in our this forever home. So part of the uh, design of the house was uh, using what's called insulated concrete form. Insulated concrete form is essentially uh, two insulated panels. Uh, separated by about 9 to 11 inches of uh, space um, that is filled in with concrete. So uh, when, you, when we designed the house um, here, um, you can see, um, just kind of looking in at our uh, window over there, you can see that the walls are actually considerably thicker than your average house. Uh, so the walls on our downstairs are about uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 12 inches thick. And most of that is uh, reinforced concrete um, that is sandwiched by those insulative uh, boards. That creates a really um, super uh, insulative uh, barrier uh, with the environment, uh, which means that you have a very energy efficient house. We have a, a 10 kilowatt uh, 30 panel solar uh, system on top of our roof. Uh, we were one of probably the last uh, group of families to get in under TVA's Green Providers Program, which allows you to sell the solar power you generate back to the grid. Um, for our uh, particular contract, we sell back to the grid at the same rate that we purchase from the grid. And uh, so what we have over here is just our connection in. Uh, so this is uh, the box where the solar pow uh, power is coming out. And then we have actually two meters this meter here is uh, showing the meter of the power that we're sending back to the grid. And then this meter over to my uh, 
right here, this is just the city meet or the uh, Huntsville Utilities meter that uh, shows what we're consuming uh, from the grid. Part of our uh, design of the property uh, for the house uh, was to have all native species plantings uh, around the yard. We're still working on that. Uh, but uh, this does a couple of things. One, um, it helps absorb uh, rainwaters um, and then also kind of creates this nice natural habitat um, that's pollinator friendly for bees and butterflies and uh, hummingbirds, uh, of which we have a lot of. We also do rainwater collection here. Um, we have two uh, 55 uh, gallon rain barrels, um, one on each side of the house out back. And we essentially use that to um, just as a additional water source should you ever need it, um, but uh, mostly just to uh, water the garden uh, during periods when uh, there's not as much rain. So this is our uh, heat pump, uh, a little bit different than a traditional HVAC system uh, in that uh, the heat pump is just really just kind of doing an exchange with the outdoor air. Uh, so whether you're heating or cooling on the inside, um, this is pretty simple um, and uh, a lot more energy efficient. So uh, we, do, we don't have um, baseboard heat for the house, um, but what this does is uh, just kind of allows for a more efficient exchange um, for the forced air that we have. Uh, we also do composting here. Again, just trying to you know limit our uh, footprint as far as trash is concerned. So anything that is organic and uh, can be uh, uh, put into a compost pile to include uh, sawdust uh, from my, my wood shop uh, we throw in here and uh, it makes great soil that we then turn back and use in our garden. So another feature that we added to the house was uh, solar tubes and you can see the little bubble up on the top of the roof. Uh, this is for the back side uh, and there's a similar one on the front that's a little bit more flush with the roof. And what the solar tubes do is it allows to bring in natural light uh, much like you would from a uh, you know, uh, having some sort of sun, you know, room or something like that and allows you to, to uh, light up uh, darker spaces. In this case, for our house, our kitchen doesn't have any windows. So the solar tubes provide most of the light during the daytime. Uh, and during the nighttime, uh, when we have lights off, um, the solar tubes have these little rings um, that charge LEDs. And so it kind of creates this night light effect. Uh, during the night so if you're getting up and you're walking through the, the kitchen there's kind of this nice little blue hue um, that you know you can kind of see your path so uh, the solar tubes are, are, are a great uh, additional um, addition to the house uh, and uh, really make a difference as far as lighting and then uh, use of uh, electricity and we think it's important uh, one it's good for the planet if you consume less energy and you use renewable resources so we wanted to be examples to others uh, with that. And uh, two, I, I think resiliency also just means, uh, you know, something that's uh, good for not only the environment, but it's good for a family overall when, you, you know, every month, you know, you're saving money um, that you don't have to spend on utilities. You have money that you can spend on other things. And so uh, stuff that's good for us and good for the planet as well. All right, that was Mr. John Rosso on Montesano Mountain here in Huntsville. We have one more, one more Huntsville uh, area video we would like to show, and that's Mr. Stephen McClam who's joined us. Um, and let's go ahead and start Stephen's video. Might help if if I uh, share my screen here with you guys. Sorry about that. All right. A couple of years ago, I swapped jobs. I was a television reporter for 25 years, and then I took another job with the Marshall County Alabama Sheriff's Office. It didn't pay exactly what I was making in television, so you know, I got to thinking, you know, how can I deal with this? You know, I can either, A, I can find me another job and work, or I can look at the possibility of, you know, just cutting back expenses. So where do you cut back on expenses? Well, 
the highest bill I've got is electricity. And so I started watching a million YouTube videos from how to install your panels to how to install the inverter and all this kind of stuff. One of the ways to really save money is to be able to add a battery storage system. And people think, you you know, the old car batteries. Now that, that's, that's out of the past and they don't do well with solar. But what does do well with solar is lithium ion technology. I mean, you use them in your hand tools and all that kind of stuff. So I had seen where people on YouTube were taking batteries, the entire EV battery module out of a Nissan Leaf and reconverting it from 300 volts down to 48 volts to match their inverters of their solar power homes. And so I looked out and found me a used uh, EV Nissan Leaf battery. I did the same. I had it sent to the house. I broke it open. I did what, what they were showing on YouTube. And so now I've got um, 14 to 16 kilowatts of power that I can use from this battery. So bottom line, I was able to get this thing done for about $13,500. Now I still need some more battery. I've learned that during the winter, but during the summer, it's solar by day, it's battery by night, and so basically, my power bill is like $29.99 pretty much every month from the spring well through the fall up until December. The power bills I was having, they range anywhere between $100 and you know, $250. So basically, if you look at how much money that I had to add for purchasing the solar system, I pay an extra $60 a month on my home mortgage add you know a $30 power bill and I'm paying about $90 a month so for most all the months it's paying for itself and then even more so it's putting money back in my pocket I'll be honest with you this is the only thing that I've ever purchased that actually pays me back you can go buy 30 or 40 thousand dollar vehicle but this thing will actually pay you back and it's well worth its money now, one of the things that I did learn is that you have to do what you can to help your house, what I call flow better. If you can get away from that electric hot water heater, that's a good way of doing it. You know, you have to compromise. So what I did was I got a tankless natural gas um, hot water heater and that was worked out well. And also um, I got mini split air conditioning units and those are much more efficient. And not only that is they will uh, use a lot less power than the, uh, than the regular air conditioners do. One of my first attempts at solar was actually to make a solar hot water heater for my pool. It didn't work quite the way I thought. You know, it's a learning curve, but hey, at least it, I made the mistake on that instead of my house. So the bottom line is this, I spent 13.5. Even if I spent 25.5, the bottom line is, it's gonna continue paying for itself. I've got electric battery backup, and so I'm covered whenever the power goes out. It's something that pays for itself, and that's why I would recommend getting you one. All right. Welcome again to anyone who has joined us in between these couple of videos we had here for the Huntsville area. Uh, again, I'm Daniel Tate with Energy Alabama, and this is the virtual Alabama solar tour. Unfortunately, uh, we, we wish we could be in person, uh, but we do have to, to do our best here with the, with the virtual uh, set up this year. And uh, su super thanks to uh, Eagle Solar and Light. You'll see a lot of their videos in the Birmingham area here shortly. Uh, so uh, again, really appreciate y'all joining us. And yeah, we are now ready for uh, some, some questions. Anybody have any questions? It looks like we do have a few in the chat already. So I'll start it off. Uh, if John, if you and Steven can kind of come off mute. Uh, it looks like the first question I have is actually for John. And that is, uh, what the heck is an insulated concrete form? <laughs> okay, so uh, insulated concrete form um, is uh, just a method of, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different building method. And uh, as I was explaining in the, in the video, uh, just think of like uh, two inch foam boards that um, have about nine to 11 inches of spacing between it. And you fill that void with concrete. So it's insulated concrete and it's a form. Um, when they um, built the house, 
it was uh, kind of like building Legos. Um, they brought all these foam boards in, they popped them out that had kind of web meshing in between it. They stacked them up like Legos. They cut out um, where the doors and the windows would go, go and uh, put in the frames for that. And then they lined, uh, you know, the rest of the way through with uh, rebar and then they poured the concrete in and then they let that set. And uh, that became the exterior walls uh, for our house. Excellent. Um, and it sounds like it's way more efficient. Um, just a follow up question of that is, you know, do you do you have any sense of how how either much more efficient and or much more you felt like that was an investment over kind of traditional stick building that maybe most of us are used to? I, I certainly a, a uh, if you if you think it about it from a long view mindset, like I'm planning to be in this house for quite a few years. Um, so we did insulate a concrete form on the first floor of our house. Um, and, and so uh, by design, the second floor is actually two by six uh, stick, uh, stick frame construction. Uh, but uh, for the walls on the, on the bottom floor, it was $35,000. That's a little bit more expensive than to do the traditional two by four stick frame. Um, but with that extra thickness in the walls, um, the, the amount that you save as far as transferring, you know, uh, cool, you know, when it's when it's hot uh, during the summer, uh, you know, the transfer of cool air from inside to outside is, you know, practically nothing. Same thing in the winter when, you know, you've you want to keep your heat in. Um, these walls are super thick, um, and uh, I guess a testament to that is, uh, you know, during the hot Alabama summers, uh, typically I'm paying anywhere from zero dollars uh, on uh, the electricity bill uh, to, um, you know, maybe ten dollars, fifteen dollars, um, and that's the combination of the um, energy efficiency of the walls of the ICF walls. And then also the solar panels that, you know, where I'm generating power and I'm selling back to the grid. Chat for you, or I guess really for both of you, but I want to pose it to you first. And that is, you know, how, how big is your system? How many panels do you have? How much, how much power does it actually generate in terms of uh, your overall usage at home? Um, I have 12.4 kilowatts and that's around 36 panels is what I have. Um, to be quite honest with you, I rarely see it go over 8,000, and that's when the house is in the middle of the day in the heat of the summer. Uh, it's got the air conditioner that's going real hard, and then on the other hand, it's trying to charge those batteries back up for the night. So I probably have a little overkill, but it doesn't hurt because it just allows toward the end of the day to continue uh, generating power from the house and not putting any pressure on those batteries um, until they absolutely have to start kicking in. Looks like we have a question in here from Nancy, who is uh, pretty, pretty enthralled with your solar pool heating, uh, and one that wanted to know, like. If you could explain a little bit about, you, you know, you mentioned that it didn't go exactly the way that you intended or thought that it would, like what happened, what'd you do and kind of what did you learn from that process? What I did was I used PEX uh, to create these large circles uh, inside a box with a uh, plexiglass outside. Uh, the problem I had was I thought, well, it'll, the reason I wanted to do it be able to kick in the heat in the uh, early spring to get into the pool. So what it was supposed to do was the sun was supposed to heat up those coals that had the water that was being pumped from the pool in there and create a thermal uh, heat process and then go back into the pool. Uh, what, I, what I didn't do right was that it, it really needed to be angled more straight up as opposed to straight across. So it really has to uh, face the sun as best as possible. Uh, also, the plexiglass I used was probably a little too thin. Uh, anybody knows me, I'm, I'm pretty uh, thrifty. So my own thrift is costing me there because ultimately what it did was that plexiglass as the heat did get hot, uh, more so in, in 
May and June, it caused it to crack. And so then it, then it just defeated its purpose. So I'm going to retry it again probably uh, this coming spring. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on the top of my shop, which faces straight up, and uh, it has a, a red root. And so that, that may, may very well help a lot better. John, how, how big is your solar array? And, you know, you mentioned that you, you were getting like zero to $10 bills in the summer. Uh, what's the winter looking like? So our uh, first, uh, our solar array is, uh, we have 30 panels. Uh, so we're sitting somewhere right around about uh, 10 kilowatts. Um, during the winter, um, and this is probably the one thing that I would have done differently with our house. Uh, so we run a heat pump as opposed to a traditional HVAC. So we don't have a uh, furnace. Um, here on Montesano Mountain, uh, it does get a little bit uh, cold during the winter. And so the heat pump does struggle a little bit uh, to um, you know, heat the house. Uh, so we have heating strips. Well, the heating strips, uh, those, those elements, uh, the, that does consume a bit of power. Um, so what we see typically during like uh, December to maybe early February time frame, our bill goes up to, uh, and this is this is the total bill, which uh, includes uh, trash, water, and sewer uh, as well. Um, we'll typically see a bill between a hundred dollars and one hundred and ten dollars, uh, and that's just because we're in the cold of winter and and we are generating less power from the panels and consuming more um, on the heat strips to, to heat the house. And I apologize if I miss this in the video, but uh, you talked about a heat pump HVAC. Do you also have a heat pump water heater? Like I know Steven mentioned that he's got, he went to gas. Uh, are you on electric for water heating? Yes, we're, we're on uh, electric uh, for uh, water heating as well. Um, and we used a uh, ream, um, it's known as a hybrid system. I, I really can't explain why they call it a hybrid, but it's a, it's, it's a traditional tanked um, water heater. Um, it's pretty efficient uh, as far as uh, how it heats. Um, so we really don't see it consuming, you know, large portions of, of our power bill. Um, that's the other thing. So on Montesano Mountain, uh, we have uh, no natural gas pipelines up here. So if you're going to use, you know, any kind of gas or anything like that for a house, it, you're, um, you're on propane up here um, if, if you want to do that. Otherwise, you kind of have to be all electric, which is, is kind of cool. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I said, it, you know, the, the one, one drawback with the heat pump is, you know, I am paying a little bit more. Um, what I had initially talked about with our builder was um, doing radiant floor heat. Um, the floors uh, in our house are concrete, they're exposed. Um, and uh, I think that that would have been a little bit better option for us as far as uh, maintaining uh, heat uh, during the winter um, and a little bit cheaper. Got it. Yeah, just a quick reminder to folks, if you have questions, make sure to throw them in the chat here on the Zoom, or if you're joining us on Facebook Live, make sure to throw your questions in the comments below. Um, but Stephen, I have a question for, for you. You know, you, you mentioned in your video that, you know, you, you were extra thrifty about how you did this. And it's really interesting, I think, to a lot of people that, uh, you know, a lot of times people think about solar or they think about a lot of these uh, options on their homes, they're oftentimes picturing things that are, you know, way above or out of the reach uh, price-wise for a, a lot of Americans. Uh, but you really give a good example of how you were able to, to make that affordable. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, where you decided to spend money? Like as you're looking at your system and all the stuff that goes into it, like the panels and the wiring and the inverters and the batteries, about in your research where you really felt like, you know, this is an area we need to, we can't skim. Yes, um, the areas that I did skim was on my uh, solar panels themselves. Uh, I actually got them from a, a dealer out of Texas uh, who had gotten a hold of a, uh, a solar farm. They got hit by a hailstorm, 
and the insurance uh, you know, took care of that job. So what they did was they went in and tested the ultrasound to find out which panels were okay and which ones were not. Uh, and I said, okay, well, maybe I can skim here. They've worked great. I mean, I can't complain one single bit. Uh, the batteries, uh, I, I skimmed on those because um, the bottom line is this. They're looking at things like graphene, flow batteries. I want to get just to the next cheaper battery technology. And I feel like these will do that to get me there. But where I did spend my most money, and to be quite honest with you, is just more than half of my entire investment. That was my inverter. Uh, I purchased a solar converter. And the reason I did that was because one, it's American made, and two, uh, it does everything that you want it to do. Uh, in, in the past, they would, you would have to get, you know, solar charge converter, you would have to get an inverter, you have to do this, you have to do that, and you can wire all these things together. This thing is all wired together, it's all computerized, so it thinks for you. It, it goes, okay, well, there's not enough uh, sun, so I need to pull from battery. And it does what you tell it to do. So it, it's, uh, they haven't had an inverter like this out that I'm aware of until the last couple of years. So. Yeah, I, I didn't mind spending uh, the seven thousand dollars for that that particular inverter. Not to mention, it is warranted for ten years, and they have tech support uh, seven days a week. So, you know, if I have a question, I can call them, and they're always willing to help out. So, yes. Uh, real quick, Stephen, uh, Martha wants to know what what was the name of the inverter or the brand that you got? It was Solark. S O L hyphen A R K. I got the Solark 12K. They come out with a 5K, I believe it is now, but you know, for, for my a regular house, you're going to need the 12K. That's the most recommended. Got it. Got it. All right. I have a couple more questions that have come in here. Um, you know, Barbara makes a, a good point about selling back to the grid. So she talks about Huntsville Utilities. And Stephen, I believe your, what was the name of your utility again? Is it ARAB? ARAB Electric. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's on a, 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 a Utility very near to Huntsville, but just across the river and in Marshall County. Um, and so if both of you and I guess, Stephen, if you want to start about the process that you went through and kind of how payment works, like you're selling back to your to the to the utility. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that works now? And I'll throw it the same question to you, John, and then also uh, some updates about things that have changed since uh, both y'all were able to get in on some older programs. Mm -hmm. It's yes, the, the, the older programs were much better. Uh, I chose not to sell back to the utility uh, because one thing they wanted was like a, and it's not, I don't think it's the utility, I think it was TVA, uh, a $500 um, non refundable fee. Uh, that's just to start and do the paperwork and, and, the, and the buy, which, what they pay you now uh, isn't really worth it. I don't think it's you know, based on the fact that I would have to pay $500, and that would take a long time to pay back, back over time. So I just elected not to do that and basically uh, zero out my meter. That's my goal is to zero out my meter each and every month. So you're basically using your system and batteries to use as much as you can on your property and just buy less from the utility, but not necessarily send them anything. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, unlike people who are kind of, and I don't know, there's different forms, but uh, for me, uh, I'm going to have to pay a $21.80 base meter fee each and every month to have access to it plus the taxes. So basically $24 a month is what I am going to pay each and every month period. That's, that's just like it would be for anybody else. So basically what I'm using is you know, the past month, I, I want to say it was around $5. Wow. Oh. And, and John, what about you? You, you mentioned in, the, in your video that you were, you know, one of the last ones on TVA's Green Power Providers, which is kind of a program that doesn't exist anymore. But um, and I, and I'll provide some update for that, but how, how did that process work for you? And then a follow on is logistically, like literally how, how do you get paid? Do they send you a check? Is it a credit to the bill? Like, how does that work? 
Yeah, so it was pretty streamlined for, for me um, because this was a new build house. Uh, and uh, the company I was using was uh, Southern Solar uh, with uh, Chris Shearborn. Uh, and they really kind of took care of all the paperwork uh, with TVA, with Huntsville Utilities. Um, I don't recall a very big entry fee to be able to do it. Um, I do get the availability charge uh, every month, you know, on my bill for, you know, having, you know, uh, power to the, the house. And I don't, you know, some of that's, I think, related to, um, you know, that I sell back to the grid. As far as how I get the, the money back, um, the way it is, is it's, it, again, it's very seamless. Um, when I get my Huntsville utility bill, uh, it has uh, the, you know, as I pointed out in the video, I have two meters. It shows the meter uh, that uh, shows my consumption and uh, how much you know I consumed and the associated cost for that. And then it uh, shows my meter for uh, generating power and uh, how much I produced and the, uh, you know, the amount uh, that that's worth. And uh, they just basically, you know, like I said in the video, most months they cancel out. Uh, so I see something along the lines of a zero. So no checks or anything like that. It just uh, makes my uh, utility bill uh, much lower. And John, a question's come in for you as well. Do you do you have battery backup or, and if not, do you have plans to do that or how how might that work? Considering you're on an older, an older program. Oh, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. So originally, uh, the vision that my wife and I had was to be uh, or, or to build an off grid house. Um, but when we became aware of the TVA um, program, uh, we did get in on that. That said, we built the house uh, deliberately uh, so that we could put a battery system in at a later date. So I have direct plumbing from the top of the house going to a cabinet um, in our garage um, that has been specifically reserved uh, to have a battery system. Since then, uh, I've been working on a um, kind of a, a different, an alternative plan uh, to where I add uh, five more, five to six more panels on the back of uh, my wood shop. And that feeds a Generac battery system um, that can become a failover um, should I lose power to the house, I can then go off of that uh, Generac system and uh, power the house from there. Um, I'm kind of still tinkering around with a little bit of, uh, uh, of how, you know, which way I want to go. Um, and I think uh, it was already mentioned um, in um, oh, with Steve's uh, uh, video there. Um, he, uh, you know, with uh, uh, things like, um, uh, Ford coming out with like their E150. Um, um, you know, one of the things that they say that it can do is that it can uh, be that battery backup to the house. So I'm kind of taking that in consideration. Um, and I guess the last thing that you know, I'll just add in here is so, I mean, we do have a, an EV, we have a Tesla. And so even the, you know, what I was given quoting before, as far as what I pay electric bill wise uh, during the summer, that includes charging an EV um, at the house. And that also includes running a, a wood shop in the back that, you know, has a considerable amount of uh, woodworking equipment that's uh, hungry for electricity. So we're still doing pretty good in that, that regards. But yes, short answer, um, we, do, we, we are planning to have some sort of power backup. We don't have it right now. I wanted to show, you know, Stephen's video and his experience and John's video and his experience are these are two uh, very viable, but but different, right? They're different ways to approach the problem uh, of, you know, how, how do we go solar, right? And and they're not, they're both, they're both totally viable in the sense that uh, in, in Stephen's case, he ha already has battery backup and what he's trying to do uh, is much more like something that you would frankly, have to do today, considering that there are no uh, or very few uh, incentives from TVA or the local utility. So the programs uh, that Stephen could have gotten on, uh, if it weren't for fees and taxes uh, that don't exist for John and Huntsville utilities, um, you know, you kind of look at, you got to look at what's, what's the options from your local utility, are there taxes and fees, 
we're starting to see a lot more utilities try to go that route. Unfortunately, uh, that's a whole nother can of worms we can open up some other time. But um, on that front, you're starting to see that because uh, utilities are acting this way uh, and there are not uh, programs like John took advantage of, uh, a lot of people are installing solar uh, on a home or even some businesses and just trying to use it for their own consumption, right? They're not feeding into the grid. They're not touching the utilities equipment so that uh, they can get full value, right? It, if Stephen buys a kilowatt hour from ARAB Electric Cooperative, that might cost him 10 cents. Uh, and if he uses his own, he's offset 10 cents worth of uh, that kilowatt hour. Whereas if he tries to sell it to the local utility, he may get two cents now uh, for that kilowatt hour. And he's got to pay a tax or a fee on top of that. So you start to see where uh, these programs and actions that utilities have taken over the last couple of years uh, really change the ways that people uh, have to go solar, at least here in the North Alabama area. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the Birmingham area here, here shortly. Um, do have one more question, and then we would uh, love to introduce Kathy Henderson with Eagle Solar and Light and talk about uh, some awesome projects that have been done in the Birmingham area. But uh, Liz has a question here about the thoughts of using DC is uh, DC air conditioning, heat pumps, you know, solar, the, the energy coming off of a solar panel is DC as opposed to AC. And uh, if either one of you had thoughts or did any, any investigation as to uh, using DC instead of AC. I just feel like I was at a concert or something, all that AC and DC I was throwing around. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, I guess my short answer is uh, we hadn't thought about uh, using DC. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as I was explained, um, how our heat pump works, it's actually really, really good for the Alabama summers um, and keeping the house cool. Um, so that's probably, you know, for us, that's probably not something that would necessarily um, work as, as, as well. I mean, it could work, but it uh, wasn't something that we considered. Yeah, yeah, my thoughts are, I mean, I mean, my system is how my house is set up for AC, so everything revolves around AC. Now, for an example, if I were to build an interior structure, um, I would have to consider a cost of running cable and uh, power and all that stuff out to that existing structure. Therefore, uh, that to change things. Uh, I could very well would consider uh, DC power AC systems because uh, I've seen them and, and that's a good use for them. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I've, I've, I've actually only ever seen one house, although I'm, I'm sure there are others out there that I don't know, but um, there is there was a, a gentleman that I met, uh, and I believe he was in Coleman County that went uh, all DC. He he actually built a, a brand new house uh, and and wired the whole thing for DC and solar. Uh, but he like you mentioned there, Stephen, like he was able to do that from scratch, right? So like a lot of stuff can be built or bought that way because. RVs and marine uh, technologies and stuff like that are all running off of DC power. So the technology exists, but once you kind of have an existing home, it becomes a lot harder <laughs> to go through and rip everything out uh, that you've already probably spent a good bit of money and investment on. So Stephen, uh, John, thank you all so much uh, for A, allowing us to come out and, and take a video. We thought uh, these turned out great and, and were excellent. And we had some great questions here. We really appreciate y'all's time. Uh, and answering them. Y'all are, of course, welcome to stay. We have a few more videos from the Birmingham area. And uh, Kathy, if you are on, on, the, on the Zoom, I'd, I'd love to introduce you. Yeah, there she is. There's Kathy Henderson with Eagle Solar and Light, uh, one of uh, the great solar installers here in Alabama. And I uh, want to give her the floor and do a little introduction of her and her company and uh, what they do. And yeah, let's take a look at some of their awesome projects that they've done in the Birmingham area. Kathy, take it away. Good morning. I appreciate you inviting me in on this, um, Daniel, and thank you so much for coordinating it. Um, yeah, so we are Eagle Solar and Light. We're uh, coming up on five and a half years, um, which is uh, probably a little bit young, what it sounds like. But actually, um, as you know, the, the Southeast is kind of 
slow to adopt solar. So um, we're actually the oldest probably in the area for the most part, but we're also, also the largest installer. Um, because I'm sure you've heard of the capacity reservation fee in Alabama Power Territory, we mostly focus on commercial industry um, and, and industrial as well. We do do some residential. We've done off-grid. Uh, we're really focusing a lot on hybrid residential systems right now, which is a really interesting topic if we ever want to go there. Um, but I think what we're going to be highlighting today is our commercial businesses. Um, these are, um, you know, we're seeing very exciting growth. Um, we're having big conversations with companies who understand that sustainability uh, portfolios are an important part of their customer base, their supplier base. Um, so the discussions are really starting to take off tremendously. So we're very excited of what's going to happen over the next uh, few years, particularly if there's some changes um, uh, in some upcoming policies. So um, yeah, uh, feel free to get those videos started. And um, again, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce what I do there, but I am a senior sales engineer. Um, we, uh, my background is actually engineering. Uh, and then I went back to Penn State to get a sustainability policy and management. So uh, kind of a interesting, it's chemical engineering was an interesting part. So it's kind of an uh, unusual switch to um, the electrical side, but um, my heart is really is and passion is in sustainability. So uh, our group is all very passionate group. We have actually um, nature biologists, um, uh, state policy, uh, excuse me, state department folks, you name it. We have a, a really wide diverse group of folks who are in it simply because they're very passionate about it. And um, so, um, you know, anytime anybody, um, you know, just loves to talk to us, we're, we're more than excited to um, educate, so. Yeah, and I actually do have one quick question for you before we start some of y'all's videos, and that is y'all are based out of the Birmingham area, but can you give folks a good sense for where y'all work, uh, really here in the state of Alabama, but I know y'all even do some work outside of Alabama, uh, because I think we have some people here that are from all over the state and interested in, especially like the hybrids type of stuff that you're talking about, you know, and, and are looking for qualified professionals like, you know, are you are you available uh, in Montgomery or Huntsville? Absolutely. We are based in Birmingham. We have two main offices, Birmingham, actually in Durham, North Carolina. We're um, licensed in Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and recently Mississippi. Um, so we're recovering the Southeast. We're also part of Amicus Cooperative, which is actually the nation's largest solar independent co-op. Um, which is great. We buy in mass. And so it gives us some very competitive pricing. But it also keeps us very up to date on continuing education and just um, having other solar independent solar companies to work with. So it's it's been a, a great part of, of what we do. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Most of our projects are in the Birmingham area, but we certainly travel. We go to Montgomery, Mobile. Uh, we've had some Atlanta uh, installs um, and then we mostly focus around the Research Triangle area up in North Carolina. Um, but we also have a, a few homes actually in the Asheville area as well, a highlands, that kind of that uh, section of the, of the southeast. So, um, you know, it's 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 growing, <laughs> which we're very excited about. That's excellent. All right, folks. Well, let's get started with a couple of videos uh, from the Eagle Solar and Light team for uh, commercial uh, installations here uh, in Alabama. So I'm going to share my screen and let's get started. I think our first video up is uh, probably one of my favorite, just because I don't know how y'all were able to shoot this video without partaking, uh, but that is Ferris Ailes. Uh, so here's Ferris Ailes and Eagle Solar and Light. <laughs> That, that is not the right one. It's one second. <laughs> storage. Uh, my apologies for that. All right, let's try this. There we go. Ferris Arsenals. My name's Killian Dunn. I'm the accountant here at Ferris. 
Yeah, so a big point for Ferris was um, getting the sustainability side of everything. So using solar panels to uh, offset a good 30%, sometimes 50% of our energy is really awesome. Uh, we're looking into a big recycling program as we go through a lot of cups. Um, that's yeah, at Ferris Sales, we really focus on making uh, lagers, IPAs, uh, big imperial styles, a lot of fruited sours. Um, we have a mixed culture program where we make uh, wild ales. Uh, that's where Ferris kind of came from. Barrel, wild nature, outdoors, building a brand around that. Uh, yeah, so here we've got 288 panels. Uh, that'll produce 435 watts per panel, the max uh, output of 125 kilowatts. I'm a math guy. I feel like that's a lot. Um, so like I said, that's going to help with everything. There's a 25 year warranty on these REC panels, um, which is awesome. It is, we're a business, we're in it to make money. And so having some kind of savings costs rather than using out, you know, using output of power using the grid for you know, a service that's already here, hope it will be here for a long time. Um, so why not use the resources that are around us in nature to help, again, cut down that carbon footprint for, you know, for generations to come? All right. Did a couple of you messaged me that you were not able to, to see that? Did everybody, was, were folks able to, to see that video? I could see it. Okay. Sorry. Sorry if we had any issue there. Uh, we do have one more video. Uh, we'll stop that and screen share one more time. Sorry for getting the order backwards. It would help if I learn how to number myself. Uh, but this one is Trustville Storage. This is David with Trustful Storage in Trustville, Alabama. And I'm Mark with Trustful Storage. We're the owners of this facility and are happy to talk about the new solar installation. We were looking to make the best use of our money and the, our electrical bills are one of our biggest expenses. And with the direct sun that these buildings receive, there's a lot of heat, a lot of electricity that needs to be used to keep them cool and keep them warm. And so we investigated and solar looked like a good choice. The cost savings uh, were calculated with several different uh, scenarios. And we designed a system that is going to cut our energy costs about uh, 70%. And over a long period of time, uh, the, the analysis shows that over a 25 year period of time, we hope or expect to save about $240,000 of uh, reduced electrical costs. We have moved into the uh, electrical room in one of our storage buildings here in Trustville. And I wanted to show you uh, what the equipment looks like that, that goes along with the solar panels on the roof. So over here, we've got uh, a thing called an inverter. We have two inverters. And then above here, there's another piece of equipment. And as you can see, they tie right into our electrical boxes that were already here. It's a very neat, I wouldn't call it simple, but it's a very neat installation and can be accessed and repaired and monitored very easily. And uh, this is the other half of the system compared to the panels upstairs. Uh, we talked earlier again about uh, saving some money by doing these installations, but uh, we also want to be good stewards to the environment. So we're, we're happy to be doing a little bit of our own part. In this facility earlier this year, we converted all of our lighting to LED lighting. That does save us some money too, but that also is, is better environmental use of our lighting. And so we're doing what we can to help the environment and uh, keep using sustainable products. We hope that with this being such a nice family friendly area that people will appreciate what we're doing and, uh, and our green efforts here. All right. Thank y'all. Uh, Kathy, I have to ask, did y'all, 
did y'all do a ribbon cutting on the roof? I don't think I've ever seen a ribbon cutting on a roof. So that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, there. you know, a, a lot of our customers don't like to actually get on the roof. <laughs> so when when we have customers who are willing to do it, um, you know, they'd love to get up there and actually see it in person and touch it. And, and um, you know, they yes, absolutely. They were wanting to get up there and, and cut the ribbon. And uh, we actually might have a second. That is literally the day that everything was was finalized. Um, we might have a second ribbon cutting with them um, with uh, the Jefferson County Commissioner. They technically fall under Jefferson County, um, not Trustful, even though they're called Trustful Storage. And they're not actually in the city of Trustful. They're, so um, we might do a second one there and try to get some more publicity for that. They're very excited about the, the program. And, um, uh, you know, self-storage is a very fast growing business for us. Uh, you've probably seen um, multiple um, announcements about, um, uh, you know, big self-storage, national self-storage companies going to solar. Um, part of that reason is obviously they all have big flat roofs um, usually. Uh, you know, and they have a very consistent energy profile. So when you start looking at about, about what commercial businesses make sense, um, it's the ones who, um, one, have a lot of HVAC demand because typically your HVACs are a huge draw in a building um, and their demand is about the same curve that you would get from sun, right? So um, when the, it starts to heat up and the sun is out the most, the HVACs um, cut on. That's exactly when we're producing the most production. So matching those two is kind of key, um, particularly in Alabama where we don't have the net metering. So what's important is that we are not exporting to the grid or at least uh, minimally exporting to the grid to have the best paybacks. So um, self-storage has been great. We're also in the process of um, installing uh, at Morningstar Properties. Uh, it's another self-storage in Homewood, um, that Homewood, Birmingham area, actually. Um, uh, so we will be starting that, con that construction hopefully in the next month or so. And then we have a, a, another self-storage that uh, was installed about two or three years ago as well. But it's, it's, a, it's a very big growing business for us. Well, I think that uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw it throw it out there. So everybody that's on this call or in Facebook Live or watches this video later, now that you know that there are solar arrays on lots of self-storage uh, locations, that means that if you need to go rent a self-storage, we need to be all putting our money where our mouth is, right? And that is giving business to the folks that we know are doing the right thing here. Uh, and frankly, just asking and saying, Hey, I need a store. I need a storage unit. Uh, do y'all have solar? And if not, you know, making that a part, uh, a question that folks ask, I think as more and more people start to ask these questions of, of the places that they do business, that's going to really get folks thinking like, ah, maybe I really should do it, do this. You know, customers of ours are asking about it. Um, we do have, uh, one more video and then make sure folks, again, if you have questions to throw, uh, throw them in the Zoom chat or right below uh, on Facebook. We're monitoring that as well. And we'll make sure to ask them. I already have some geared up for Kathy because these are great. Um, and we'll make sure to get that. We'll do one more video. This is the UAB Solar House. Again, this is open in person today. So if you're in the Birmingham area and want to go uh, take a look at that, uh, definitely go do that today. Um, uh, I know Eagle Solar and Light will have some folks out there uh, in person as well as they were involved with this project, as you'll see. So uh, one second for me to screen share this one more time. All right. And here we go. Welcome to the UAB Solar House and Sustainable Community virtual tour. In 2017, UAB sent a team of students to Denver, Colorado to compete in the Solar Decathlon Build Challenge held by the U.S. Department of Energy. The UAB teams, named for Survive AL, presented the house and placed fifth out of 11 teams. The house was brought back to Birmingham after the competition to become a part of the campus and a cornerstone of our new UAB Sustainable Neighborhood. Because the house was damaged traveling to and from the competition in Denver, it had to have several repairs. Luckily, the house has been restored and had quite a few upgrades since 2017. The main goal of this house and the community in general is to showcase how easy it can be to integrate sustainability into our daily life. We hope to spread awareness about renewable energy, clean gardening practices, rainwater collection, and wildlife preservation. 
The sustainable community is home to three different gardens surrounding the house, which we will see later in the tour. Architecturally, the solar house was designed to have as much natural lighting as possible. Features such as the high ceiling windows and white walls ensure that the living room and kitchen remain brightly lit while also cooling off the house. Since the majority of the house's windows are north facing, the sun never shines directly into the house, making it much easier to keep these rooms cool. The house was actually split into six parts to move to Denver and back. You may notice that there are steel rods within the roof that connect it to the base of the house. To combat the long and hot summers in Alabama, the house was built so that if the window on the east side and the window on the west side of the home are both open, a cross breeze will be generated. Since the east side of the home is shaded during most waking hours, the cool air from that side gets pushed to the warm side. This draft naturally cools the home. Additionally, four ductless indoor air conditioning units are used to supply air when more heating or cooling is required. Ductless air conditioning is much more efficient because it is localized and personalized for each room. Forced air units require ductwork throughout the house and can take up a lot of space. Ductwork also breaks up the insulation of the house, which makes it harder to manage temperatures. The house has a thick, well-sealed envelope, which means not a lot of air gets in or out unless desired. While this is incredibly beneficial for heating and cooling the home, if fresh air is not introduced, the air can collect pollutants that may harm the people living in the home. One of the biggest risks to respiration is a lack of oxygen and high carbon dioxide concentrations. When CO2 levels get to an unhealthy point, an ERV component will distribute fresh air into the home, and this can also reduce the stale feeling found commonly in poorly ventilated homes. The cleaning and cooking appliances used in the house were chosen with consideration to energy efficiency. Our Bloomberg dishwasher was on the 2019 Energy Star Most Efficient list. The magnetic induction stove was chosen both for the efficiency in comparison to gas stoves and safety features. When the stove is on, you can actually place your hand on top of the stove and not burn yourself. This is because the top is magnetic, so it will only begin to generate heat when a magnetic item like a pot or a pan is touching the surface of the stove. This allows for little residual heat, which lessens our energy usage overall. A combination washer and dryer was also chose to not only save space, but reduce energy consumption. Our toilets are EPA sponsored as a water efficient product, and this is because it uses 20% less water than a normal toilet while flushing. Our rainwater cistern, which is located in the back of the home, collects fresh rainwater and is used for the toilets. This house contains a hybrid electric water heater. Our water heater only uses 550 watts of power to heat 50 gallons of water, which makes it nine times more efficient than the average water heater. This reduces our overall energy use by 40% compared to using a standard water heater. Due to the many life-threatening tornadoes Alabama has experienced, the team decided that a tornado shelter was a necessity in designing this home. The interior, which was created by UAB engineering students, is made of a thermoplastic, fiberglass resin, and recycled shipping containers. This material is actually stronger than steel per unit density and can withstand around 250 mile per hour wind and debris. water for irrigating the lawn and filling the toilets. It has a UV light inside to kill bacteria, as well as a mesh filter to get rid of debris. It is made from galvanized metal and can hold 2,500 gallons of water. Alabama has more than 132,000 miles of streams and rivers with more types of plants and animals living in them than any other state in the nation. However, we also have one of the highest extinction rates in North America many of which are species that live in our rivers. 
Across Alabama, there are more than 117 million tons of toxic coal ash in unlined pits located next to our waterways. There is also a serious issue of raw sewage being dumped into rivers and streams in our state. This information was provided by the Alabama River Alliance, and I urge you to check their website for more information and ways to get involved with their clean water initiatives. Our co-light street lamps are an example of an upgrade the house has received since returning to campus. They are powered by both wind and solar, which charge a battery at the base of the lamp, allowing them to stay on through the night. If you look up, you can see 28 solar panels on top of the house and six larger panels on top of the storage container. Our solar array produces 11.22 kilowatt hours of power. In the container, there are four batteries that hold 16.5 kilowatt hours each for a total of 66 kilowatt hours. Batteries ensure that at night, the house will still have electrical power. They store power so that when the sun is gone, the house can still run smoothly. If there were no sunlight, we could run the house off of battery power for about four days. Next to the container is a natural gas generator. This is purely for emergency purposes. The natural gas generator will only be used if the solar panel's electrical supply is interrupted and all of the battery power is used up. Replacing fossil fuel power plants with renewable energy sources, including solar, wind, hydropower, and geothermal power, would reduce a diversity of pollution in greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse gases have far-ranging environmental and health effects. They cause climate change by trapping heat and also contribute to respiratory disease from smog and air pollution. Extreme weather, food supply disruptions, and increased wildfires are other effects of climate change caused by greenhouse gases. At the Sustainable Community, we are trying to showcase simple ways to reduce our carbon footprint while also preserving wildlife and practicing clean gardening. The Blazer Kitchen Gardens, located right across the street from the Solar House, provide fresh produce to the campus food pantry named Blazer Kitchen. The pantry is located two blocks down the street from the house and serves members of the UAB community experiencing food insecurity. Right to the left of the house, across the street, is our UAB Community Gardens, where staff, students, and faculty can rent a plot and grow their own produce. At UAB Sustainability, we have a garden intern that helps take care of the grounds, crops, and weed eating. We also just added honeybees from Foxhound Bee Co. and um, many pollinators around the sustainable neighborhood, as well as throughout the entire campus. Directly behind the solar house, there's a very lush and overgrown hill that we call our meadow in the making. We are not treating with pesticide or mowing the grounds to support more vegetation and habitat for wildlife. The meadow is also known as a monarch way station. We planted milkweeds that provide nutrition and shelter for monarch butterflies that migrate through North America. They should be migrating through Alabama in late September, early October. And once the butterflies actually eat the milkweeds, they become poisonous to birds that would like to eat them. All right. That was the UAB Solar House. Um, there's a lot there to try to unpack that, but that is a, a lot of awesome, a lot of awesome projects. Um, so Kathy, I guess the first question I have, uh, well, actually first, uh, make sure y'all are throwing your questions for us in the chat, uh, or uh, if you're watching on Facebook Live uh, right below the video, we'll make sure to do that. Um, yes, Kathy, I guess, you know, the last video here, you know, can you explain or tell folks a little bit about like what y'all did as part of the, uh, what Eagle Solar and Light did as part of that UAB solar house. And then I noticed there was a trailer behind, or like a storage container behind it. Um, and it is, that's new, right? So that, that's something that was added later. Uh, right, this is, um, system is completely off grid. Um, and as you know, uh, if you're gonna go off grid, you have to have um, batteries and a backup. So the storage can container, um, warehouses, uh, the four batteries and the inverters, charge controllers, so forth. So that space uh, gave us two things. It gave us additional places to put more solar 
and then a place to keep um, all the uh, equipment for the battery storage. Yeah, so I, I have to give you a softball here that's uh, given by, by Philip Foster, and he says, why aren't more flat roofs so filled with solar panels? Um, because I agree, what, what, what's, what's stopping, what's stopping us? Honestly, it's, it's education. Um, we spend more time educating customers, uh, really more than anything the, the, that is really just getting the opportunity to get in front of people. And once we do, I can't tell you how many times I say, this is a no brainer. Why isn't everybody doing this? I mean, that is a lot of times the first question that people have. Um, so you know, it's, it's getting the opportunity to get in front of people and explain it to them. That's why we love the solar tour. We love, you know, any kind of opportunity to speak to, to business owners, to get a part of, you know, Birmingham Business Journal articles, anything like that, because uh, uh, it, it, it is a given. Distributed generation is the energy of the future. Um, it's about producing it and using it in the same location. Um, and um, obviously, we have some federal incentives. You know, we have the 26% tax credit right now. Um, which is a great incentive. Uh, and of course, we, uh, if you're a business, you do get to include depreciation as well. Um, and then of course, uh, there are some opportunities for USDA grants. Uh, if you're in a rural area, you have another 25% of your um, business gets to, uh, it has to be a business, um, gets to uh, apply for a USDA grant for solar energy. Um, what we're up against, unfortunately, sometimes is, um, there are no state incentives at this point in Alabama, uh, and there are no utility incentives. Um, that is not the case in every state, and so we have hope that that will change in the future. Uh, in North Carolina, we actually have net metering as well as um, uh, Duke Utility has some fantastic uh, incentives. In fact, our focus up there is actually the nonprofit industry, which can get as much as $75,000 towards a um, a solar system, which is just, so we're focused on, on nonprofits, churches, um, uh, and that kind of stuff. So in, in LMI community, you know, low to uh, moderate income community is fantastic. It's really, so we, we get, you know, all sorts of good, you know, knowing that we're helping clean energy and helping nonprofits who need it the most uh, is a great, you know, feel good up there in North Carolina. Um, and then Georgia has some other um, incentives as well, but, um, we're working, you know, uh, obviously we, we still have a ways to go in Alabama, um, but because our electricity uh, here is so expensive, we're actually ranked 14th in the United States for commercial electricity prices. And that information is actually from the Energy Information Administration. So we are only behind California, Hawaii, Alaska, and the Northeast states in commercial electricity prices. So Alabama is right up there. So we have some very expensive electricity so anytime we can offset with solar, so let's say a commercial business is paying 14 cents, sometimes 12 to 14 cents, um, we can produce solar at three or four cents. So anytime you are offsetting from what you're buying, you're, telling, you're putting 10 cents back, uh, per kilowatt hour back in your pocket. So, so the economics end up very good here, which is good. Um, so, um, but not good is that we're paying a lot of money for our electricity. So um, yeah, it's a yeah. it's, uh, growing business. No, I'm really glad you said that because I think a lot of people hear oftentimes um, this, frankly, it's, it's, it, maybe it was right at some point, but it's no longer the case that we have, uh, you know, some cheap, cheapest energy rates or lowest energy rates in the nation. And, and, and maybe either that was true at some point, um, or it may be true for some of the, the largest of industries that have sweetheart deals, but for the for the vast majority of people and the vast majority of small businesses, as you say, uh, that is not necessarily the case. And um, when you're paying probably a, a good bit over what most of the states are paying in terms of per kilowatt hour, like 14, 15 cents, that's a that's that's a that's a big difference. I mean, to put it in perspective, the the commercial rate here in Huntsville is about 10 cents. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's, that's 50% more for commercial power, just a few counties South. So, uh, can, can easily see how that can make such a big difference when you're trying to figure out, uh, the economics of a project. Um, mm -hmm. so thank you so much for, for mentioning that is really important. Um, a couple of questions that came in here were about the, the batteries at the solar mm -hmm. house. Did, did mm -hmm. y'all do the batteries? What, what are, what kind of, what kind of batteries are they in? And, and why should people consider those? Sure, yeah, Fortress batteries. Um, we actually have a lot of, uh, we, we really like the Fortress battery. It's, um, 
uh, 18 and a half kilowatt hour storage, which is fairly large for a 200, a single phase system. Um, so, and they're in the same range as something that might be uh, like a, a power wall as far as price goes, but holds more. So we love our Tesla power walls, uh, but the Tesla power wall holds closer to about 13 kilowatt hours. So we get a little bit of extra storage for the price. Um, so we have installed those uh, at uh, uh, several residential um, uh, locations across um, Alabama and actually in Georgia as well. Um, and uh, they're easy to program as well. We like the, the way um, that they work. Uh, they are actually on the um, DC side um, rather than the AC side and they're easy to program going back and forth between uh, you know, time of use and um, uh, maximizing your solar capabilities. You mentioned time of use. So what is, what is time of use and, and how are you seeing homeowners and businesses take advantage of time of use rates with batteries? Sure. So um, Alabama Power's reserv reservation capacity charge is applicable to uh, family dwelling rates um, and um, the, uh, the um, school rates and some other light and power small rates. Um, but if you would take advantage of their RTA rate, uh, which is residential time of use uh, advantage, um, you actually don't have to pay the capacity reservation fee. But the kicker is that uh, between one to seven in the summertime, their rates get extremely expensive, uh, anywhere from 25 cents to 71 cents a kilowatt hour. So you, pulling from the grid during that time is not an option. So the only opportunity to use, switch to the RTA rate is to have batteries so that you are not running during those key hours, one to seven um, in the summertime. And so, sorry to put a pin on this because it's really interesting, I think, for a lot of people is you can have these batteries and you mentioned one of the key selling points or features of this battery is that you can program it to say, like you mentioned those specific hours, right? One, you said one and seven and say, all right, between these hours, these are the these are the go hours. So do everything you can to charge outside of these hours and don't use the grid um, between these hours. And it kind of optimizes automatically and figures out how to make that happen to make sure you're not accidentally pulling a bunch of really expensive power from the grid. Is exactly. Right? Exactly. And actually, when you're not at those peak hours, you actually pay less than if you were on the family dwelling rate. It's closer to about eight cents. Um, so yes, so the idea is you charge from solar and from the grid um, when you're off of those peak hours. Obviously, we prefer the solar, um, but if it's a if it's a cloudy day, it can it can choose. It, it chooses the solar first, and then if the solar can't provide, then it pulls from the grid to charge the battery. Interesting. And, and just for uh, uh, if anybody wants to go check that out, if you go to our Eagle Solar and Light YouTube channel, and then you go to our Solar Tour, I believe group. Um, last year, we highlighted a hybrid system. It's uh, the, called the Froelich House. He's a gentleman here in Birmingham who has one of these hybrid systems that we're talking about. Yeah, that's great. Um, we'll definitely throw a link to that here in the chat in just a second. Um, so a question here from Nancy is, uh, do you see much, she said chicken houses, or maybe you mentioned USDA grants, like other agricultural related options here in Alabama? Uh, we... Um, we have uh, not done a chicken house, but we have a lot of inquiries um, regarding. Uh, I know there are some in North Alabama that I think Southern Solar maybe has installed. Um, but yes, they do get to take advantage of the REAP grant. Um, so uh, it's it, there. I, we, we think there'll be more to come. You mentioned with the, the storage, they're perfectly situated that they they all face due south and due north with the roof intentionally. They all mostly use energy during the heat of the day because of the fans that you see to keep the chickens cool. So it's just like the, you mentioned earlier about the, the perfect load profile, like you, you know, mm -hmm. the chicken house is another one that, that looks really, really solid. Um, yes. Philip here asks about UAB uh, having an offsite solar farm. Um, and if anyone at Eagle is talking with them or know about, I think, uh, so I think what Philip may be talking about or asking about is if you're aware of UAB or maybe others that are looking at larger uh, arrays to try to work with entire campus or maybe hospitals and things like that, if you have experience with those. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Um, 
we, we, we have a little bit of solar actually on UAB. It's very small. Um, the, unfortunately, with UAB being a nonprofit, they can't take advantage of the tax credit. So um, there is probably hope they do have a big sustainability plan. I think they want to add more solar, um, but it's got to you know, be economically feasible, obviously, as well. Um, when we start talking about solar farms, um, because PPAs, which is power purchase agreements, are illegal in the state of Alabama unless the utility is doing them, um, we, uh, we can, UAB, we could not produce a solar farm for an independent company or a nonprofit and then put that back on the grid for somebody else to buy. Um, that, is, that is not legal in the state. So um, uh, Alabama Power can, they can put out a solar farm. In other words, uh, uh, in Lafayette, the solar farm they have there uh, supports Walmart um, uh, and the, they use that for their sustainability plan. But uh, personal companies uh, are not allowed to make those kind of contracts with um, uh, colleges. Well, I appreciate the softball you just gave me to plug uh, Energy Freedom Alabama uh, and to say that, you know, you, you heard Kathy talk a lot about some of the projects that they're doing in North Carolina with churches and nonprofits and things like that who uh, don't don't they don't pay federal taxes. And so they, they need things like uh, PPAs, power purchase agreements or third party ownership. There are lots of ways you can structure contracts uh, so that nonprofits, churches, school districts, local governments, or frankly, just people who may not have the upfront uh, ability uh, to, to go solar, but want to and take advantage of those savings. And so that's definitely something that that we at Energy Alabama and many others around the state are, are actively pushing for. And as Kathy mentioned, you know, it's going to, it's, it's not something that's currently at least uh, fully legal or at least is currently clear as mud. And so we're, you know, looking to uh, advance legislation here in the state that would clarify, would fix this issue so that really anybody could enter into these types of power purchase agreements and, and access the, the benefits of renewable energy and energy storage. So definitely appreciate that. Um, I, I, I did not I did not ask you to give me that softball, but uh, no one else <laughs> believe that, and that's okay. <laughs> so. And um, yeah, we do solar leasing actually, and it's a little different in the, in, than PPAs in North Carolina, but it's extremely popular for those groups who can't come up with the capital for a, a cash purchase of a system. Um, uh, so uh, solar uh, solar leasing allows them to to pay on a monthly basis, similar to their power bill. Right, and that and that you can do in Alabama, right? Solar leasing? Yeah. Have y'all done leases in Alabama? Uh, no. Um, it, no. <laughs> yeah. No, not really. Mm -mm. Yeah, there's a, I'm aware of a couple of leases. And, and again, it's just kind of gets into why we kind of need the legislature to act just to say, listen, this, this is all, you know, perfectly fine. But as Kathy was hinting at earlier, you, you can't really buy electricity or energy from someone other than your kind of incumbent monopoly utility provider. Um, but you can lease equipment or you can, uh, you know, lease space and things like that. So there, there are some creative ways to to get around some of those perceived restrictions. But um, again, we, we definitely could use some clarification from the legislature just to make this uh, easier and, and, and better for the market. So um, yeah, Kathy, I have, I guess, just really one more question for you. And that is, uh, can you give us a, a sense of maybe some of the other projects that you've done? I know that I was just going down uh, 280 uh, to Auburn for the EV event. And I think I saw one of your projects uh, at a bank and yeah, just didn't know if you had any other projects that y'all are, you know, especially proud of that you kind of wanted to highlight. Absolutely. Um, Summer Classics is our largest install. Uh, they're down in Pelham. You're probably familiar with them. Um, they do the large furniture production. Um, uh, South Point Bank is the one you passed on 280. We're especially proud with that because it's very visible. Um, so it's our most visible array. Uh, the front side is actually a, a specialty panel, um, which actually looks more like a TV screen than it does a solar panel. It's got a black backing and you can't really see the silver uh, bus bars on it. So it's um, very, um, you know, goes with the architecture of the building. They love it. Um, but we also have it on the um, back side of the building as well. Production's not quite as good there, but they wanted to cover their entire roof and, and offset a good portion of their, their power there. So if, again, talking about trying to support sustainable businesses, South Point is one of the few banks um, that actually has solar on their roof and, and the folks over there are fantastic. So a little plug for them. Um, 
Uh, again, Fair Sales, first brewery in the United, in uh, Alabama to go solar. We're very excited for them. Um, they're a great group over there, and it's a it's a. And, uh, we're actually doing a restaurant in that same little area with them called Mexicali Blues. We're in the process of finishing up construction on that. Um, Warren Averett, the huge accounting firm um, that covers you know, really internationally, but their headquarters there on Acton Road has solar all over the top. They're actually also one of our YouTube, if you go to that same YouTube channel, um, Warren Averett, uh, you can see theirs on there. Uh, it's a three-story building, so we're all only offsetting a small portion, but to, accountants love solar. I mean, they're like, again, no brainer. Why would I not do this? Um, it saves me money, there's tax credits. Um, so accountants love that. And accountants have, have referred to us to a lot of other businesses, including um, Capstone Real Estate Investments, in fact, if you go to Office Park in Mountain Brook, uh, we now have probably the most concentrated solar part of the state. There are three buildings just in Office Park in Mountain Brook. Uh, if you know where that is, we have Cobbs Allen Insurance, uh, Lad Realty, and Capstone Real Estate Investments. All have uh, solar covering their roof. Um, uh, the projects, honestly, are coming so fast these days, it's almost hard to, uh, to keep up a little bit. Um, we have uh, recently signed a contract with a large um, uh, company in uh, Birmingham um, uh, that uh, we'll be very excited to make a public announcement about. I'm not quite ready for that yet, but uh, it's, it's going to make a big statement uh, about the fact that they are um, putting solar on their roof, and um, we're very excited about about that. But yeah, go to you know check out our website. We have our North Carolina and our Alabama and Georgia uh, uh, systems all on there. We try to keep the updates as much as we can. Uh, we do anything as small as residential, as big as, you know, a uh, megawatt or so. We, you know, the only thing we really don't get into is utility scale. So. Because distributed is the future, right? That's right. <laughs> We need we need all the things though, so that that's that's great. Um, yeah, and we're yeah. excited. You know, the Tesla um, batteries are uh, a great um, um, you know name. Obviously, being associated with Tesla, we're the only Powerwall installed installer in. Actually, we're the only one that were certified in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. So we get a lot of Powerwall inquiries. Um, we're looking at Tesla solar roofs, um, which we are not, uh, we have not installed yet, but we're hoping to in the near future. There's been a lot of inquiries about the Tesla solar roof. Um, so uh, that one's a little different. We do have to work congruently with a, a roofing company, obviously to do it because it is the roof itself. It's not something that sits on top of your roof. Um, and, and I have to say that it is quite pricey, um, but a lot of people like it. And then um, and because a lot of people are restricted by their HOA of what they could put on the roof, uh, that gives some people some more options as well. So it's 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 so fun. Honestly, it's it's so exciting to talk about. You can tell I get a little excited talking about solar and and um, and uh, you know that's why we love our jobs. Yeah, no doubt. That's that's exactly right. This is fun stuff. So um, Ka uh, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks you. Thanks to everybody for for being here and taking a look at uh, the the Huntsville videos, the Birmingham videos. Thanks to to Kathy, to John, to Stephen for answering questions. Uh, we will definitely have a recording of this that if anybody wants to take a look later uh, and we can, you know, always make that available. And I will also make sure that everybody that is registered and, and that was here uh, gets a copy of that as well as contact information. So if you have you have questions that you want to direct to us or, or Kathy or other owners uh, from the Huntsville area, you know, this was the whole point of the Alabama Solar Tour. I, I sure as heck hope that finally maybe next year we can get back in person because uh, love seeing y'all, but we'd rather see you in person. Uh, that, that is much better uh, to be able to see this stuff in real life. But the whole point is being able to talk to real people who have done it, who are doing it. Uh, and so it, we want to make sure that contact information is exchanged so that people can talk to each other. Uh, and thank you guys so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your, your Saturday, the rest of your weekend. And we'll see you later. Thanks again, Daniel.